In this video, we'll take a look at the biconditional rules in Fitch style system. Let's take a look. All right, so let's begin by thinking about the biconditional informally. So a biconditional tells us that the connected sentences are each a necessary and sufficient condition of the other sentence. So if you've got one, you'll get the other. If you don't have one, you won't have the other. So that means if I have, because they're both sufficient conditions of one another, if I have a biconditional, say P if and only if Q, and then I have one of the other sentences independently, so whether that's P or whether that's Q, let's say it's Q, then I'm going to be able to infer P. And that's because Q suffices for P. Q guarantees P. Of course, P also guarantees Q. All right, so that rule is going to correspond to biconditional elimination. We get a second rule, which is going to correspond to biconditional introduction. And if you'll remember, conditional proof or conditional introduction, if we assume a proposition and then show that Q follows, we get to have if P then Q. Well, a biconditional is logically equivalent to the conjunction of two conditionals. One going one direction, one going the other. So one going from P to Q, the other going from Q to P. So if I show this, and I show that from the assumption of Q, P follows, then I can infer the biconditional P if and only if Q, or Q if and only if P. doesn't matter which direction. All right, let's take a look at these in the Fitch style system. All right, so here we have biconditional elimination, which tells us that if you're given a biconditional, or you've proved it, and you're given P, you're giving one of the sentences that's connected by the biconditional, then you can legitimately infer the other proposition. So that's what our diagram represents. Ignore this for the moment. It tells us that somewhere in the proof we get to accept P if and only if Q to be true. <clears throat> then somewhere in our proof we got one of the sentences that's being connected by the biconditional here, in this case P, and therefore it's le we can legitimately infer the other sentence, in this case Q. The point of adding this is simply to draw your attention that it doesn't matter which of these connected sentences you get. As long as, so whether it's on the left side or the right side, as long as you then get to accept one of them as being true, you're going to be able to infer the other. So that's unlike a material conditional, where if you had if P then Q P, you would get to infer Q. But if you had if Q then P, and you had P, you don't get to infer Q. So, not exactly the same as conditional elimination, but it does have similarities to it. <clears throat> All right, so we have to cite biconditional elimination, and we have to point to whoever's reading the proof. We need to point to the two steps, one that's the biconditional, the other which is one of the 
propositions that's given independently um, in order to legitimately apply that rule. All right, let's look at the next formal rule. All right, so the next formal rule is biconditional introduction. And it lets us know that if you are able to show that under the assumption of P, Q follows, and under the assumption of Q, P follows, then you can discharge out of those assumptions and infer either um, P if and only if Q or Q if and only if P. So again, ignore this guy for a second. What this diagram tells us is that whatever may happen prior to these assumptions, if I assume P and then I can get Q, and then later under a different subproof, I can infer uh, P from Q this time, then I am able to um, infer P if and only if Q. And that's because, if you'll recall, biconditional is basically logically equivalent to the conjunction of two conditional statements where one is running one direction, the other is running the other direction. Well, this just does run one direction and then run the other direction, P to Q and then Q to P. So it is that conjunction of two conditional statements, one running one direction, one running the other. Now we can infer P if and only if Q but from that those two um, subproofs we can also legitimately infer Q if and only if P. Okay, so in order to correctly cite this we have to tell whoever is reading our proof that we have one subproof that moves from an assumption um, P to Q, and then we have another subproof that runs the other direction Q to P. So that's how we cite it correctly and apply the rule correctly. And in the case of biconditional, it's helpful. To fill out the structure of the proof before we actually go about proving anything and what that does is that these proofs can be um, they can be lengthy sometimes so filling out the structure prior can help you remember what it is that you're doing uh, what it is that you're up to all right so let's take a look at these rules in the fish computer program so you have some familiarity about how to execute them All right, so in this argument, we have one premise that says P if and only if Q. Our second premise says Q. So by biconditional elimination, I can infer P. And that's because this says that P is a sufficient condition for Q. And Q is a sufficient condition for P. Since Q suffices for P and I have Q, I can then therefore get P. Or, if the argument had been set up this way, P if and only if Q, P, then I can infer Q. All right, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. All right, in this case, I have three premises. We have that A is medium if and only if both B is medium and a tetrahedron. We then have the premise that B is a tetrahedron and that, I'm sorry, that B is medium and B is a tetrahedron. So I see that because two and three are both true, it would guarantee that the conjunction B is medium and B is a tetrahedron is true. I can infer that 
using conjunction introduction. I now see that this sentence, both B is medium and B is a tetrahedron, just is the right side of this biconditional. So I know that by biconditional elimination, I'll be able to infer that A is medium. Or if the argument was A is medium if and only if both B is medium and B is a tetrahedron, and we had the proposition A is medium, then by biconditional elimination, I could infer that. B is medium and B is a tetrahedron. So one of the things I want to highlight in this case was the biconditional elimination works even when one of the sentences being connected by the biconditional uh, symbol is a compound proposition. All right, let's look at the biconditional introductory rule. All right, so in this case, what I want to do is to infer Q if and only if P. So I know that that means I need to show that P follows from Q and that Q follows from P. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is sketch out this proof. Now that I'm going to want to assume Q and eventually infer P, oops, infer P from Q, and I know that I'm going to want to assume P and be able to infer Q from that. With this sketched out, I see that I have a conjunction of two conditional propositions, one running one direction, one running the other direction. So I see that uh, since both of those conditionals are true, I'm going to have a way in which I can isolate each of those independently to break them out of that conjunction, as it were. And that if this is true, the right conjunct is true, then given under the assumption of Q, it's going to follow P. And I see that the same sort of reasoning is going to hold only from the assumption P and the left conjunct. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and infer both of those conditional statements from this conjunction. And now I see that from 3 and 4, I can infer P from conditional elimination. And I can see that from 2 and 6, I can infer Q 
And so I've shown that P follows from Q and Q follows from P. And that's precisely the type of situation I need in order to use biconditional introduction. And I'm going to infer Q if and only if P. All right, let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. All right, so in this example, I want to infer either A is a tetrahedron or B is happy if and only if D likes C or A is large. And I have two premises, A is a tetrahedron and that A is large. Since I'm wanting to infer a biconditional proposition, I know that I'm going to want to show that one of the sentences being connected follows from the other and then the other follows from the aforementioned. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch, oops, I'm going to go ahead and sketch that out. So I know that from either A is a tetrahedron or B is happy, I'm going to want to infer that either D likes C or A is large. And then I'm also going to want to show that it runs the other direction. That from D like C or A is large, it follows that A is a tetrahedron or B is happy. All right, in this case, I see that 2, A is large, is one of the disjuncts of 4, namely the right disjunct. So 2 guarantees that the disjunction in 4 is true. And I can infer the disjunction in 4 by using disjunction introduction and citing what guarantees that it's true, namely two. Six, very similarly, I can see that A is a tetrahedron is the left disjunct of the disjunction. And so by disjunction introduction and citing one, I can infer six. All right, that gives me that one proposition uh, follows the other, and I can use biconditional introduction then to infer a biconditional. All right, so. One of the things I want to point out here is that um, biconditional introduction can work or can be used uh, even when the biconditional is connecting two propositions that are compound sentences. All right, that finishes this video on the biconditional rules in Fitch system. Hope you found it useful.